let me introduce you to our very own speaker today um we are very very honored to have professor christopher abraham with us who has three post graduate qualification in human resource management business administration marketing labor and administrative law and as a phd in business administration uh, in design thinking and innovation he is a certified design thinker from ideo which is stanford and is a fellow of the chartered institute of marketing uk he has about 34 years of experience in management consulting marketing and management education in india singapore and uae currently he is the ceo and head dubai campus and senior vice president institutional development at the sp jain school of global management a forbes top 10 economist and a ft top 100 ranked business school with campuses in dubai singapore mumbai and sydney professor abraham has been a visiting professor at many leading universities in australia usa canada singapore and uk earlier in dubai he headed a, uh, the executive mba program of xlri jamshedpur which is one of the in asia's top business schools we welcome you formally sir i am glad uh, that i am uh, introducing you so we'll quickly jump to the topic today um, now uh, i think all of us will agree here there has been no time in the history wherein the entire world has felt disconnected has um, has felt this um, i mean has stopped at the same time and i think uh, the credit goes to um, uh, our pandemic that it goes to COVID around. So, um, and which brings us to the topic today, which is on global citizen and experiential learning. Now with everything connected um, virtually, um, I would want to know from you, sir, from your own experience, um, how, what is the importance of being a global citizen and how hands-on a hands -on experience of different careers kind of um can pave a way for the future generation now uh, to give you a brief we have um mostly we have students and educators who are listening to us today and they are from different regions as you can see um on the chat box also so we would want to know from you um what do we mean by being a global citizen and why is it important and in, in this era Interesting. Thank you very much and a very warm welcome on behalf of our institution, SPJ in School of Global Management, and of course, Mindler, who have given us this great opportunity to share some insights on the relevance of being a global citizen in a world that is increasingly connected. A few years back, one of India's uh, big thinkers who's currently settled in Singapore coined a very interesting word called connectography. And this was a gentleman called Parag Khanna, who is a globally renowned global strategist. And he used the word connectography. And connectography is a combination of two words, connection and geography. And what he meant by that was through the technologies that we have, it's inevitable that the entire world is connected. On the wrong side, when Lehman Brothers sneezed in 2008, the entire world caught an economic recession as a cough. When there was something that happened in a laboratory or in a wet market in um, you know, Wuhan, the entire world got affected by the COVID-19 virus. So these were the bad examples of globalization. Notwithstanding, it's inevitable, good or bad, we are intricately connected. We need to know what's happening. And I'm going to give you the good side of the relevance of global citizenship, which I would believe is more a mindset than anything else, an experience that you gain out of exposure. And once you get that exposure, things are never the same. I've got a simple presentation for you, which I'd like to take you through. It's picture rich, so less of uh, content and more of pictures. So you're going to enjoy it. At the end, I promise Vaishnavi, even if it takes a little more time, uh, please feel free to ask any questions. I'd be more than happy to extend so i'm going to spend about 40 45 minutes doing the presentations uh, it doesn't need to the q a need not confined to 15 minutes if you have more questions 
I'd be more than delighted to answer them because this is what uh, passionately moves me, okay? So this is what my life is all about. Talking to youngsters, talking to teachers, talking to professors, uh, talking to career counselors, and this is what excites me. So if I can ignite a spark in the next 45 to 45 minutes to an hour, I have done my job. So give me just a few seconds. I will share my screen and then we are good to go. Right, can you see my screen? Say yes, put it on the chat if you can. So I know that, yes, okay, thank you, great. Uh, I might in between ask questions, you know, professors are known for asking questions. So with the same speed, I would encourage you to actually write your answers on the chat. So the topic for the evening is global citizenship and experiential learning, and permit me to take you through a beautiful journey where we'll crisscross ideas, thoughts, maybe to some different parts of the world, as in this big... Such a unique experience. I've grown so much. Just do it. <laughs> So the idea behind this is what happens to a student when he or she is exposed to a global experience? Here's what happens. Every time you visit a new country, every time you're exposed to a new culture, every time you're exposed to a new global experience, what happens is something fascinating that happens inside your brain. Your brain starts making new neural connections and your brain starts absorbing every little and big experience. It actually doesn't know what to do with it. So it actually, you know, observes and absorbs. Then what happens after a certain point of time, after you've had these varied experiences, maybe cultural, maybe personal, maybe uh, related to, you know, recreation or entertainment or even business or leadership, you get to know these things and they're all in your brain. Now, fast forward a few years down the line, you're in the real world of business. And when you have a global challenge, some of these things come into picture, global awareness, global citizenship, global resources, global fluency, global intelligence, a word coined by Harvard University, uh, global competencies, global skills. What do these things really mean? Do I need all this? India is large enough for us to take care. Why do I need to move out? Because India is very closely connected, like every other country connected to the world. It is inevitable that we need to do it. Let me give you a simple example. A few years back, ITC, one of India's large multinational corporations, brought in a very interesting initiative called the e Chaupal. Some of you may have heard of it. And e Chaupal was started to reduce the challenge of middlemen and agents who are actually looting and usurping innocent farmers. So e Chaupal is an internet-based platform where the farmer who could be a cotton farmer, could be a rice farmer, wheat farmer, any commodities, he would be able to access through the internet the global prices for his product and then decide whether he wants to give it to, uh, you know, the local agent or not. Now, initially, there were a lot of skeptics who said, you know, farmers, illiterate, uh, they come from rural areas, they can't. But here's the good news. Within a few weeks, almost all the farmers associated with that initiative were able to, and to give you a live example, there were cotton farmers in some parts of India who, when they wanted to actually sell their cotton seeds, they would first check up with the Chicago co commodities market, the London commodities market, and these guys may not even know how to speak, but they had systems which were able to translate their rates into Hindi and the local lingo, and they were able to make decisions. So this is the power of Global Connect. And I'll, as I progress, I'll give you many more ideas on how this can be done. Now, let me ask you a very simple question. Who is your friend? 
Many of, and you know, I have two categories of people I'm talking to, elders like me, teachers, professors, counselors would say my friend would be probably, you know, my school friend or uh, uh, let's say my college friend or my colleague. And uh, students, youngsters would say my friend comes from all over the world. They could be digitally connected through Instagram, through Snapchat, through Facebook and whatnot, right? And who would you call a stranger? Because the world's geography, the world's cultures, the world communities have come together to create what we call a global community. Today, you have the power in your hands. The ubiquitous mobile device can connect you with people across the world. So the borders between who is a friend and who is a stranger gets reduced on a daily basis. What does it mean to be literate? You know, is it learning geography, history, physics, maths, chemistry, uh, computer science, English, and language, or is it beyond that? So to attempt this question, last year, there was a very interesting analysis done by Harvard professor John Kay uh, with the World Economic Forum, and he identified six intelligences, not just literacy, but six intelligences that you need to strive to thrive in a post-pandemic era. I'll quickly run through each of them. I may not have time to describe, but I can give you the source so you can check them out. World Economic Forum, six intelligences in a post-pandemic era, Professor John Kay. Number one, ethical intelligence, the ability to know what is right and the ability to do what is right and appropriate. Number two, social and emotional intelligence, the ability and intelligence to understand our own feelings and to work effectively with friends, relatives, colleagues, and anybody else whom we interact with. We are social creatures. Number three, innovation or generative intelligence, the ability to come with out of the box ideas, creative ideas, think like a design thinker. And the fourth one was technological slash digital intelligence, the ability to use technology appropriately, whatever function, whatever discipline that you take over. So let's say you're preparing yourself to be a doctor, you need to know the engineering design behind medical equipment because a doctor today is no longer about human connect, it's also about the ability to use technologies. And the full fifth one was about uh, transformative intelligence, the ability to transform through leadership and other smart skill competencies that can help us to become better individuals, better leaders, and better managers. And the question, where and how do we learn? Maybe if I'd asked this question prior to the pandemic, the answer is obvious, but today as the chairs, empty chairs represent, you don't need to go to a physical classroom to learn because the barriers of a physical classroom have been broken thanks to COVID-19, as Vaishnavi beautifully put it. And yes, so that is a new world that is there, which we have all started adopting to. We even have a nice fancy term for it. We call it the new normal. And we are now adapting to learn through different platforms rather than a physical connect. Now, I want to share a very interesting example from our own business school. Uh, when the pandemic hit us, we had all our students coming face to face, and we had these fascinating experiences in our different campuses in Dubai, Singapore, Sydney. And then came the pandemic. We were caught in a quandary. In each of these countries where we operate, we were asked to shut down our classrooms, shut down the school, and send our students back. Thankfully, we had two Mumbai campuses. We were able to accommodate our students. But even then, some of our parents from different parts of the world. We had students from South America, North America, Europe, Asia, Africa. How do we connect with them? So we started exploring different online platforms. Now, SP Jane, I don't want to boast too much about it because it's a very common session, but we are innovatively much ahead of the curve. So a few years back, at least one and a half, two years back, even before the pandemic, we had invested in some amazing online technology called ELO. Later on, you might want to watch it or I can get my colleagues to send it to Vaishnavi and she can share it with you. It's available on YouTube, ELO. ELO stands for Engaged Learning Online. So this is a mechanism which is far superior to even the Zoom uh, platform. It might sound very bombastic, but you can check it out and then you'll know. So the question of where and how we learn today is very, very different from the way we understand it, which means your mind and brain should be open to do it any which way. Now, as we speak, we have programs where we are face-to-face, -face, we have programs through our ELO, and where we connect with communities and students across the world. 
Where do we go for information? Traditionally, we would go to our elders, then we went to the local school, then we went to the local libraries. Today, everything is right there at the touch of a button. I'm not saying say goodbye to your school. We still need them, we still need teachers. But at the same time, today the access to information has almost become global and inclusive. As long as you have a good enough internet, you would be able to access the world. A classroom has no boundaries, has no borders. The borders are only in the minds of the policymakers, the administrators, and to some extent, teachers, students, and parents, because there are no boundaries. So one of the initiatives, again, that we started during the pandemic was to connect with universities and colleges with whom we never had any relationships. Our students got a unique opportunity to work on projects with students from probably Russia. And these are real examples. Spain, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, some parts of Africa, especially Nigeria and Rwanda, so on and so forth. So the idea is that the classroom need not necessarily be a physical room with four walls and a projector, right? And a few rooms. And you saw this picture. So we have an opportunity to explore the world right inside the confines of our home. And of course, nothing to beat the real experience of moving out and actually physically uh, experiencing this from different uh, contexts and countries. How do we read? Today, reading again has different connotations. We don't need to read from a physical book. We can read it from Kindle readers, EPUB readers. You can read it from hundreds of different options available as apps on your app store. You can get someone to read it for you. You know what I mean, right? So you don't need to read it as well. You can have audiobooks that can read the stuff for you and you listen because you could be a, a, an auditory learner and that becomes extremely relevant. We have some of our executive MBA students who actually convert their written document into a PDF document into audio files and listen to them while they drive from their office to class. So different ways by which we read and write. So writing again, do we really write? Do we script? Do we actually uh, dictate to a machine, which I often do to write my articles and news items? So how do we write? You know, it's it, now the fine art of writing has actually gone. I still remember getting knocked on my knuckles when I had a bad handwriting and mostly from my mom, who was a teacher and who had great handwriting. She still has a great handwriting. But today you can get away with it and say, Mama, I don't need to write. I can dictate to my uh, you know, dictaphone or dictate to my computer, which will do the writing for me, voice recognition systems. How do we collaborate? The earliest system of collaboration was like this. When one kid sleeps, uh, a few of them listen to music, the rest of them try to collaborate. Today, you have the globe as your collaborator platform. At Stanford Design Thinking, we use a very interesting initiative called the Stanford Design Thinking Initiative. It's an open source global platform where problems of all kinds and all characteristics are put across and people across the world volunteer. There's no payment for it, but people volunteer out of goodwill and compassion. They volunteer with their brilliant ideas. And trust me, folks, the kind of synergy that comes from these ideas is seen to be believed is seen to be believed. So even the norms of collaboration have changed. There's no need to have face-to-face. -face. You can have collaborations across. Another interesting one that we started a few years back was to collaborate with teams from our different campuses in Dubai, Singapore, and Sydney, get them online and make them do online projects and then do presentations, right? So the norm of collaboration again has changed. And last but not the least, how do we communicate? Now we can communicate through face-to-face, -face, which is what we have heard about. Then we went to mobile phones. Then we went to social media. Then we went to Zoom-like platforms. Today, you have hundreds of ways by which you can communicate. And you can even communicate your ideas, your thoughts through platforms like YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, you name it. Today, you have the privilege of a whole new world of communication available to each one of us. Our world, it's not changing back. Post the pandemic, it's going to be different. Be ready. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm not a doomsday prophet. I'm a very positive guy. I believe things will definitely get better. But please be aware that there would be something or the other that comes and disturbs us. It could be a pandemic, it could be a catastrophe, it could be a natural disaster, it could be a man made disaster, it could be a world war. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is the ingenuity of the human system is so powerful that every time we're hit by some kind of a negative experience, we bounce back. We bounce back with power. I want you to keep that in mind. So even though the world may not change back to the old norms, 
be prepared and be ready that you and I are equipped with an amazing internal human brain system, a thinking system. And once it combines, once that human brain system combines on a collaborative level with friends and uh, you know uh, associates across the world, it is going to be a completely different experience. Quiz time. Who are these people? I want you to put your answers on the chat. Uh, so please uh, start putting some answers. Yes. Anybody? Who are these people? Yeah, broadened thinking, experiential learning. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that example. I'll give you answers, uh, Johnny. I'll answer all these questions at the end. Yeah, excellent. Okay. But tell me, who are these people? One answer, just one. Okay, Arvind Krishna. So if somebody has identified, Subhadra, you've identified Arvind Krishna, you can probably guess the rest of the people. Leaders, okay, Manpreet. 50 marks for that. Global citizens. Salma, well said. Well said. Global citizens. I'm going to combine Salma and Suma's words. Global celebrities. Okay. All of them are global celebrities. All of them, for us from India, they are all from India. No, no, Sunil Gavaskar is not there. <laughs> That's a Sunil Gavaskar lookalike. But all these gentlemen, and there's also a lady in between, are global business leaders right from our motherland, India. You can glimpse their names in the next slide. Okay, so these are these people and this is just a partial list. It's just to give you a flavor of what we can do once you become global citizens. So well done to the people who guessed it right. And the one who said Sunil Gavaskar, you can now recheck. Well, he does look like Sunil Gavaskar, but he is it, right? Okay, so the idea is that from these guys, now we know, and I, I deliberately left out Satya Nadal and Sundar Pichai, because you would guess it, but one of you certainly was smart enough to guess Arvind Krishna, well done. And there are many more, many more, and these are rock stars right from homeland India. The first degrees were all from India. They went abroad, uh, educated themselves, got into global schools, global uh, business schools or global engineering schools, and then went on to become global CEOs. And the list, as I said, is indicator. There are many more like this. So there is a shift that is happening in the culture of education, okay? So the way we learn, the way we collaborate, the way we communicate, the way we talk, I've given you different perspectives and it continues. So 2030, if you keep as a benchmark, because the next 10 years are gonna be very, very exciting times, we're gonna see that the future we want is right in our fingertips, not even in our doorsteps, but in our fingertips. I wanna show you another video of what SP Jane does when it comes to global learning and, uh, you know, experiential learning. And then later I'll take all the answers. Yeah, this is a video, sorry. This video is about technology, which is now hitting the education space. And the next one is, of course, the SP Jane video. Sorry. I remember the teacher talked and we listened. We had to memorize quite a lot too. A lot of time was spent giving out books and collecting them up again. We were sitting in rows in desks so we could see the board better because talk and chalk was the way. There must be an industrial revolution in education in which educational science and the ingenuity of educational technology combine to modernize the grossly inefficient and clumsy procedures of conventional education. Sydney L. Presse, 1924. These young people are studying in a new way. A computing calculator designed for use in high school classrooms has created tremendous excitement among educators. The tool which has made this possible is the high-speed digital computer operating with electronic precision on great quantities of information. If we think about the... third industrial revolution, that was PCs and the internet. And, and we've just about caught up with that. The fourth industrial revolution is what becomes possible from those technologies. Industry 4.0 is the next big shift in the way that manufacturing operates. Digital know-how is going to be hugely important. And then people will need to be flexible because the world will change. At the future workplace and future societies, uh, we're still moulding them as we go and technology is one of the main pillars in what is shaping what the future will look like. The pace of change is remarkable. With the introduction of these exponential technologies, 
creating a paradigm shift to create education 4.0. Okay, so that's the big lesson, that these new technologies are converging to create a new paradigm shift called Education 4.0. So when we look at uh, learning, we need to now start looking at it from a completely different perspective. Thinning the walls of our classrooms, which means breaking the walls, not physically, but metaphorically. Talking to strangers, again, not the conventional anti-wisdom because your mama, grandma would have told you, don't talk to strangers. We are talking about connecting with strangers across the world. And the third one is being open and transparent. So three new paradigm shifts in the way we look at learning. Now, in an era of ubiquitous interconnections, global awareness does not mean simply learning about other cultures, foods and holidays. It's much beyond that. So what we need is a global community created through global students and global teachers, and of course, global experiences, which is now possible, which is very much possible today, initially digitally, and where possible, where the, the, the opportunities abound, like in SP Jane, you can certainly experience it really. So globally connected teachers collaborate, communicate, amplify, and share. Today, there are a number of initiatives from top universities across the world, including the Harvard University, which has created a community of global teachers who are connected with each other, who collaborate, communicate best practices, learn from each other, amplify, and share those best practices with friends and colleagues. So it's not just about talking about the world, but most importantly, talking to the world. Vicky Davis said that very profoundly, and I think it makes a lot of sense. So learning with and from the people, from the world, okay? So that's global learning for you. And which means it results in something called global competence. Let us define global competence with a couple of interesting insights. I'm gonna share with you a Cornell experiment a Harvard research and a business case study for what we really mean by global competency, which results in global citizenship. First, the experiment. In the year 2002, Cornell University did a fascinating experiment to find out whether people exposed to different global cultures have a different way or a creative way of solving problems. So they got in a bunch of people, one and divided them into three categories. One category were people who had a single country exposure, that was the United States. A second category were people who had United States plus another country. And the third group was people who had multiple country exposures. They had studied somewhere, worked somewhere, did an internship somewhere, went on a tour to another country. So more different diverse experiences. All of them were given a very interesting challenge called the Dunker Candle Problem. Every single participant was given a candle, a box of matches, and a bunch of brass tacks. And the challenge was to fix the candle on a wall and light it, and then ensure that the wax from the candle, burning candle, does not fall on the floor. Now, this sounds very simple. It's one of the most challenging, perplexing problems ever. Here are the results. The ones who had a single country exposure had an 18% success rate. They cracked it. The ones who had a two country exposure had a 34, 36% success rate. And the ones who had multi country exposure had a 68 to 70% success rate. What's the secret behind it? Neuroscience today has an answer, which I described earlier. Every time you go to a new place, you are absorbing these new experiences and the brain being a remarkable pattern connector and a dot maker actually connects these dots and finds solutions. My second one is a Harvard research that was done in 2010 and Harvard University wanted to find out what are the key competencies and skills that you need to survive in the 21st century, which was dramatically changing. At that time, we didn't have a pandemic, but it was just after the economic recession of 2008. And guess what? The number one intelligence that Harvard identified was what they coined as global intelligence. And what is global intelligence? The ability of an individual or a leader or a manager to adapt to any environment and work in diverse environments in collaborative, communicative, and creative, meaningful ways. And lastly, my story of a business case study. The year was 2008 when the world was going through a recession and in the automotive industry, which was equally affected, there were a couple of iconic British brands that were virtually on the brink of disaster. 
These two British brands called Land Rover and Jaguar were actually owned by an American company called Ford Motor Company. And ironically, you could find an at that time unknown automotive entity from India called Tata Motors who took over very boldly, audaciously, these two British brands which were dying. And Tatars were virtually blasted by the business media. They said, this is a stupid idea. This is an idea that won't fly. Tatars have made a mega mistake in all their hundreds of years of experience, blah, blah, blah. Fast forward to 2012, when Land Rover and Jaguar actually got a revival in the marketplace, their market shares went up, the product relevance became a shot up, and Tatars were hailed by the same business media as a remarkable success story. So the question to all of us is that, how did Tata pull this out? Let me go back to 2008. When Tata's took over, they had this British car company, which means English culture, British practices, British mindsets, owned by an American car company, which had American mindsets, American culture, so on and so forth, now taken over by an Indian company, which is known for Jugaad, and I'm using Jugaad in a very uh, positive uh, manner. How do you do it? How do you get these guys together? So what Tata's did was a remarkable story on integrating the best ideas from the British uh, way of doing things, the American way of doing things, and the Indian way of doing things. And lo and behold, you have a success story in the making. Friends, the message is loud and clear that the global exposure that you have can prepare you to be a successful global citizen in any context whatsoever. So this is the business case for it. So what, in, what do you need to do? Sitting where you are, you can investigate the world. Like a little kid curious to know what's happening around, each one of us need to have that curiosity to investigate what's happening around. Recognizing perspective, this is critical. Now, when I'm investigating the world, my knowledge of the world should not come from an upside down perspective. If you watch the map carefully, it's upside down. It's put there for a purpose that way. Because a lot of information that we get when we investigate the world might come from the wrong sources of information. What do I mean by the wrong sources? I love WhatsApp, but I don't believe what comes on WhatsApp. Are you with me? There's a lot of fake news that comes across, outdated, obsolete news, which gets recirculated. You have to be extremely careful. Let me give you one example to prove this. Now, let's say in the pandemic, you're investigating the world. You want to find out, you're curious to find out where it came from. You want to know how many people died in Madhya Pradesh, how many people died in Tamil Nadu, how many people died in Kerala, so on and so forth. While you're doing this investigation, you're getting a lot of information from the traditional media. You're getting, and you know what, what's happening to you? Your mind is now saying, oh my God, it's very terrible that uh, the pandemic is killing a lot of our people. To a few months back, Brookings Institute, which is one of the world's most respected research institutions, came back with a very interesting piece of statistic that said deaths by COVID. At the peak of the COVID pandemic, deaths from COVID is the 43rd cause of death in the world. I want you to get this information sinking into your system. 43rd cause. In other words, there are 42 other things, including common cold and flu and accidents and drug overdoses and suicides and abortions that outbeat the number of people who die from the COVID pandemic. I have a lot of respect and love and compassion for the people who unfortunately left us, but let's not get carried away by what the media tells us. The media just hypes up what, is, what can be taken with a perspective. Once you investigate and get the right perspective, communicate these ideas to people, which is what I'm doing exactly with a bunch of people who are willing to listen to me. And then together, let's take action to make the world a better place by doing the right thing with the right pace. Watch this. Our story began in 2004, and little did we know that we would be ranked among the world's best business schools.
kept our philosophy simple. If business is borderless, then so should business education. With that motto, we began our first chapter by setting up a state-of-the-art campus in Dubai. And soon afterwards, in Singapore, Sydney, and Mumbai. But here's what's really unique about us. Our students study in not one, but in a minimum of three international cities. And in doing so, they understand the world of business as it really is. Dynamic, ever evolving, and global. This is really where we do an excellent job. We don't just confine our students to four walls in a classroom in their hometown. We actually expose our students to the business, culture, and politics of three to four cities that are the top cities around the world. Our students will tell you about an internship that they had with Apple in Singapore. They'll tell you about a visit to the Jebel Ali port in Dubai, about an experience that they had with the Minister of Finance from India, or even a parliament visit while in Sydney. The list, it goes on and on. Really, by participating in these activities and through hands-on lessons in global immersion, our students are able to develop the skills that are really different, unique, and extremely relevant in the workplace of the 21st century. When we talk about the importance of building global awareness in students, we're often asked, is it really that important? But consider this, how you do business in the US is so very different from how you do business in, say, China, India or the Middle East, or even Africa or Brazil. You may be a huge success in your home country, but a miserable failure in another if you haven't understood that business practices, technology, political frameworks, and cultures differ. History is littered with examples of companies that have been very successful at home, but failed to make an impact elsewhere. We want to create graduates who are able to be change agents and drive growth for global companies. After graduation, our students enter a very competitive and rapidly changing business world. At SBJ, we've designed our curriculum to help our students adjust and adapt to the ever-changing global business conditions. It's no surprise to me that our students embark on careers with some of the leading companies across the world. Our efforts in global business education have resulted in our recognition as one of the world's best business schools by top international publications. What's next for us at SP Jane? Just one word really, and that's technology. Business and technology have now converged to create new business models, automation, faster fulfillment of services. 30% of the jobs that exist today may not even exist three to four years from today. 10 years ago, the name of the game was global. Hence, we created four campuses in four countries. 
students rotated from one campus to another and they understood the importance of the global business environment. These students did really well at the workplace and we owe our top rankings to this model. But now we need to prepare for tomorrow and companies today are looking for graduates who understand the meaning of technology, how high technology can improve the business model or even create new ones. At SPJ, we want to be at the very forefront of this revolution. And as you've seen, the way we have done it is to create this ecosystem. And this was actually a video which is about three years old. We now have, a, apart from our cutting edge, highly ranked business programs, we also have a bachelor's in data science and business and recently launched a master's in artificial intelligence in business, validating what our president so beautifully articulated. So how do I get started? How do you get started in this global journey is something that I'd like to share with you. Okay, there's a set of tools, some networks. So how do I know this? Become aware of global issues and interconnectedness. I gave you two uh, you know, negative examples, but be that as it may, we still understand that we have the power to connect with people because there is the internet that can provide us all the required information. One word of caution and advice, be clear where you get your information from because that needs to be valid and credible. Second one is to make a personal commitment to global perspectives, global disposition, global knowledge, and global skills. It, we, we owe it to ourselves. Now that I've given a strong case for why we need to become global, it augurs for each one of us to understand global perspectives because we are in, interconnected. Third, learning about and using collaborative tools. Today, as I said, the globe is our classroom. The physical boundaries have vanished and we are looking at collaborative initiatives through platforms and tools that can connect us with communities across the world. We need to create a personal learning network and it need not necessarily be your classmates. When I say classmates, not your physical classmates registered in a particular course. You can have people from different uh, universities, different colleges. You can create your own personal network through various uh, you know, platforms that provide that opportunity for you. And then the curriculum, which we have done, is to be amplified. What do we mean by this? A lot of learning of our student experiences actually happen outside the classroom. For example, when they are in Dubai, they go to the Dubai Jebel Ali port, which is one of the largest man-made ports in the world, where logistics and supply chain students actually see how one of the most successful port management companies actually manages. You can join projects across the world. But, you know, with student driven, faculty driven and industry driven, nothing to stop you, because, as I said, it's a connected world. And then when we envision these new projects and create these new opportunities, you are actually enlarging the perspective and scope of the curriculum. And then as a result of it, we are looking at smooth flowing, unconscious fluency, thanks to the power of the human brain to absorb, to adapt and to be agile in moving forward. Some of the tools which we have are, you know, you can see there from Pinterest to Twitter to Flickr to Skype and many, many more that have come in, which you can look at. I'm just going to finish with this. We move in a global connected world. The way we connect and the way we build communities happens through something called the seven degrees of connectedness. You start off being a lurker, which means you're outside the periphery of the community, lurking around to see whether it's worthwhile taking the next step. And then from there, you move on to become a novice, a beginner who is just trying to unravel the mysteries of global connections and global collaborations. You move on to become an insider after certain time and after certain experiences, and then have colleagues because you've now formed a network, you formed a forum, you formed a Google group, you have a network of people who work with you. And then you start actively, apart from now being a colleague, you start actively collaborating. Then some of these collaborators become friends, and last but not the least, these people also become confidants. And confidants are people with whom you share all the little and big secrets that you would dare not share with anybody else. So from being a total rank outsider as a lurker, moving on to become a confidant is the level of connectedness that you can have across the world. 
Think about just one platform like Facebook or LinkedIn, where you have the opportunity to connect with pretty much anybody anywhere in the world. And then it's time for each one of us to take. I know there are teachers here listening, counselors here, and of course, students. It's time for each one of us to take a collective responsibility to transform teaching and learning. Though the pandemic has created havoc, I would also look at it as an extremely exciting opportunity for us to create an incredible future, not just for students, but for global citizens across the world. I want to leave you with another powerful little video, which probably sums up the mindset that you need to have in order to not just survive in a post-pandemic world, but also to thrive. And then I'll take as many questions as we have. So time for us to discover, co-create, and imagine tomorrow's logic, because the future is no longer this or that. You will have to have both, because on one hand, you're going to have abundance of information and technology. On the other hand, the experience is going to be the new scarcity. So it's time for us to look at the global brain, which is the meshing of human wisdom with artificial intelligence. So it's, it's not an either or world, it's human and technology that's going to work together. And human only, this is very important, folks. On one hand, you will have AI, robotics, machine learning, deep learning, internet of things, so on and so forth, cognitive computing, quantum computing. On the other hand, there are deeply human things like imagination, dreaming, designing, creation, which will all be very human, empathy, emotions, ethics, and these would now have extremely powerful value in the years to come. So combine your knowledge and exposure to digital technologies, and don't forget that being human will put you on top of the game. And so we move from knowledge 2.0 to something called knowledge 4.0. This is all about, sorry, and this is all about creating a mindset, moving from data and information and knowledge, and finally, wisdom. Because data is available in plenty, it's meaningless. When data translates into information, it can then become knowledge which can be used. But the real thing happens when you're able to use your God-given wisdom to apply it in the right circumstances. And I leave you with a beautiful little video. Listen up, babies. Life's not fair. You get no say in the world you're born into. You don't decide your name. You don't decide where you come from. You don't decide if you have a place to call home or if your whole family has to leave the country. Yeah, it's messed up. You don't decide how the world judges a person like you. You don't decide how your story begins, but you do get to decide how it ends. Yes! So on that beautiful positive note, where the big message was that you don't decide to get how you enter into this world, but you certainly get to decide how you end. And that's where life is a matter of choices and you have the power to make the right choices, to make yourself better, your community better, and of course, the world a better place. So thank you very much for attending the webinar and I wish each one of you good luck and God bless. And I will now move on to stopping the share and taking the questions. We still have time. As I said, we can stretch it with the uh, you know, permission of the uh, organizers. And I would be happy to take the questions. Uh, would, uh, would somebody like to help me or shall I? I'll go through it, okay. Uh, uh, one yeah, question I would want to kind of ask you, and I yeah. have been repeatedly seeing that on the chat box also. And mm. I felt that I would also ask you now uh, with everything moving online and even having education online. Now, there are a lot of students out there who have never, ever attended college. OK, maybe students who are in second year right now or students who are looking at entering first year. We don't know uh, till when we will have the pandemic. 
now how, what are the different what is your opinion rather uh, with respect to experience and learning for students uh, who are looking at online form of education whether by choice or by force so what is your experience and what is your opinion on um, this particular um, uh, idea okay great question now the world has been disrupted that's a reality right so we know it's a new norm as we said and here is where human ingenuity comes in okay so the world future forward is going to be what we call hybrid and when i say hybrid i'm not just talking about hybrid in terms of the meshing of technology and the face to face i'm also talking about hybrid education models what do i mean by this one of the key initiatives innovations that we're talking about in fact i was part of a global conference this morning is we are looking at new models now let's take a typical example a typical engineering degree is 4 years now the real million dollar question is do we really need 4 years to teach these skills so today professionals professors policy makers administrators are talking the right things we had a fascinating conversation and it was actually india education future forward but i think it's global so what do we need now we need to look at what are the things that can be taught to the student in his mobile in his laptop and there are a number of things you can do which on as of now there are amazing resources moocs are available coursera edx udemy uh, you know uh, or there you know udacity and khan uh, what do you call that uh, khan academy all these are there already and many of them are free so all you need is a mindset and the right time to identify what you want i'll give you a live example so i had a 12th standard kid who said uh, and you know he was from our church he said uncle i want to go to go study aviation engineer i said why he said i love planes now that was a total disconnect i loving planes and wanting to study aviation engineering is nothing i said before you take that big big this and he wanted to do it in the us so i said before you do that big decision and put a burden on your parents find out whether you really like it and i gave him different uh, you know sources coursera had a couple of basic courses edx had a few courses i said many of them are free just try them dabble on it if you still love it if you are passionate about it then that is your future career go for it so i think the future will be hybrid in terms of content so today you, you may have also heard of this concept of stem being replaced by steam right. so it's no longer science technology math and engineering it is science technology arts engineering and mathematics why because you need that left brain right brain combination the 21st century will belong to whole brain thinkers people who can do data analysis people who can logically think people who can critically think added to how you can be imaginative how you can think like design thinker how you can design creatively both these are going to be critical skills and the good news friends is that all of us have an amazing god given brain which is left and right sometimes you put one of it to rest we don't need to uh, today cutting edge uh, research in neuroplasticity says that both these brains can be trained so if i am a left brainer thinking i'm good at math i can also be good at Uh, you know right brain thinking it's just a question of training the brain uh, the science of neuroplasticity plasticity says that at any time you can change your brain so hybrid is all about content hybridization technology integration hybridization the pedagogical hybridization for example a few uh, months back we toyed with the idea of robotic teachers you feed in data to a robot which can come and do all the mundane stuff does that mean we kick the professor out no the professor is a friend a philosopher and guy he or she will come in there when the student is stuck with all the data provided by the uh, robot so combinations of these are going to be there in fact mit has a lovely term for it called super intelligence the super intelligence is the intelligence of the future which i mentioned in my presentation but there is a term for it which is artificial intelligence combined with human wisdom the key word is wisdom it's not knowledge it's wisdom it is applied knowledge used appropriately ethically with the right kind of compassion and love and used right okay so now there are some technical questions these guys are asking guys australia will not be closed forever okay uh, it is closed at the moment and they are being a little over reactive i would say so our students who are in australia are stuck in australia our students have to go to australia are not going but don't quote me on this but by the end of the year there are indications that for sure they will and they have to open up i'll tell you what 20 to 25% of australia's economy runs from global students 
So it's a reality. It's not about the hundreds of uh, students from SP Jain. SP Jain is just one small institution there. You have uh, the Melbourne University, the Sydney University, University of Technology, and hundreds of other public universities in Australia whose future depends on our people and Chinese people. Indians and Chinese are the biggest market. So they can't keep it closed forever. I don't think that's a step in the right direction. They're being paranoid, but they are realizing. And soon, see, again, this paranoia about the pandemic will move because we'll have multiple when you have heard uh, immunization that takes place when more people get covered. That's where we lost out. We started dishing out vaccines to the world before vaccinating our own people. And that's where we lost out. But thankfully, I think better sense is prevailing. So don't think it will all be closed. All this, this is a matter of perspective. Yes, it's closed today. I'll give you a context in all our three campuses. Dubai was the fastest and the smartest to react. Last year, August, when things were slowing down, when the first wave came and went down, Dubai opened up for business. So when August it opened, colleges and universities were allowed to open. And we were very skeptical. Uh, the announcement was made in July, and uh, they said you can start by September, which is when the academic year starts. We were skeptical. We said hundreds of our students need visa. They said you start applying. And we were skeptical because things were not moving. But between August 15th and September 1st, hundreds of visas were processed. All of in every single student was able to come over, spend time at the campus. Of course, at our Dubai campus, we follow all the safety protocols, all the health protocols. You do it. Singapore was closed. Sydney was closed. Now, as you know, the latest update, Singapore is opening up. The visas have already been given. Again, they went through a second wave, but they are again opening up. So hopefully September, we'll have Singapore opening. And by the end of December, Sydney will also open. Now, at a broader level, many other countries are already opening up. Dubai has gone one step further to offer what is called vaccination tourism. So you come to Dubai as a tourist, we'll give you a vaccination, we'll also give you a tourism experience. So countries will keep inventing and innovating themselves. Mark yourself if some of you are considering Dubai. This year, October, we'll see the Expo 2020, which is supposed to happen last year, shifted this year. It's going to be a mega event with 175 countries uh, participating. It will go on till uh, May of 2022. So that's another good experience. Okay, so there are a lot of questions. I think uh, I can I take them or would you want to read them one by one? Yes, uh, so I'll pick one more question here. And uh, again, this is something I think a lot of us will benefit from that. Uh, with your experience and with everything being connected online, with countries opening up borders for investment and um, inviting students to study, uh, do you think there will be a time wherein we'll have a uniform um, uh, business practices or uniform policy or uniform culture um, and we will not have um, country specific culture but rather have a standard culture across the globe uh, yes and no that's a tricky question by the way and I'll tell you my perspective because of my experiences in different countries we will still remain Indian if you've seen I'll give you a typical cricket example okay so here's an Australian citizen from Bihar I'm just using Bihar in context so Biharis don't take offense so he goes there to Australia. He's now a full-fledged Australian citizen with an Australian passport. India-Australia match is going. Who will he support? You'll find the entire jing bag sitting there waving the tricolor proudly. And when each time Virat Kohli and Ravindra Jadeja hit a six, they will feel. So what I'm trying to say here with this little example is that our Indianness cannot be taken away. I will become a global citizen. With all the stuff that I spoke about, we will transform into a global citizen. I live for the last 25 years, I've lived out of the country, but you can't take the India out of me. You can't take the Indian out of me. It will remain forever. And I think that's how it, it's, it's like what we call a potpourri of vegetables, a salad, a vegetable salad. So you'll have the carrot, you'll have the cucumber, you'll have the cabbage, you'll have the lettuce, you'll have some pineapples to add to it, the sweet part of it. And we will all be, you know, in, uh, let's say, harmony with each other. We'll still retain the tanginess of the, the, you know, the mandarin fruit slices. You will maintain the, the, the sweetness and the crunchiness of the carrot. So you will have these diversities. We won't have one size fits all. We will be diverse, but within that diversity, we'll find a lot of confluence, a lot of uh, collaboration, a lot of uh, cooperation. What has also happened over time, and I have observed this, and I'm very happy to say this to all our Indian friends, that over time, the perception of India has changed dramatically for the better. 
So 15, 20 years back when you were when you are from India, they probably looked down at you. Today, thanks to that list of people that I showcased on our presentation, you're the rock stars. In every field, we find Indians rocking. We have had that. It's only that 400 years of colonial you know, hangover gave us a kind of slavish mindset. We are not that. We are superpower. We were superpowers long back. If you go back to our history, the Arya Bhattas and the Bhaskaras, we need to dig, dig back. We were global, global education, Daxila and Nalanda. Yeah. So uh, it won't, to answer your question, it won't be one size fits all. It won't be universal. We will become global citizens who appreciate the global practices. So yes, I will learn something from a Chinese. I will learn something from a Russian. I learned something from an American, but I will still retain my Indian identity, but appreciating and embracing different cultures. So you will find in places like, uh, you know, I used to live in Canada for some time, where we'll celebrate the Jewish festivals, we'll celebrate Islamic festivals, we'll celebrate Hindu festivals. So there's no difference. It's just that we appreciate each other, we embrace each other, we love each other, and we work together for a global, uh, peaceful global world. Yeah. Okay. You know, a recent example was when UAE signed up with Israel. Can you believe that? An Islamic country signing up with the Jewish, they were, they were enemies for centuries. And then you had Bahrain, then you had Saudi Arabia, now you have Qatar, now you have Sudan. There's a whole Abrahamic accord, as it's called. And Abraham happens to be the patriarch of all these three religions. So these kind of things are happening. New power, you know, centers are emerging. Uh, it'll be very, very interesting talking. Yeah, so I have some questions which people want about yes. the experiential learning, game-based experiential learning and all that. Today, again, see. Uh, and the neuroscience of learning tells us we learn when it's made fun. You know, this is so ironic from coming from a teacher, because when you listen to a lecture at a certain point of view, you feel bored. So you want to engage. How do you engage? People get engaged when they play. So games become relevant. So any concept today can be taught through games. We, in fact, I didn't mention it, but one of the things we extensively do is simulation. What's a simulation? A simulation is a computer-based game on a particular concept. It could be leadership, it could be marketing, it could be finance, it could be supply chain. You're simulating a game environment and pitching against each other. The second thing which excites the human brain is a reward system. When you're competing with each other, you know, you feel that when you do a one-up, when you're better than the other, your brain's dopamine comes out in full flush and you feel very excited. Even when you're playing a card game with your family, when you win against your mom or your dad or your sister, you feel proud. Why? Because your dopamine's gone, you know, uh, flushed and it feels very happy. So that's the reward system. So gamification has a lot of science behind it. So if your parents out there, don't discourage your children from playing games. Find out what kind of games they play because there are certain games which are very detrimental to mental health so we have to be very careful but other than that games the excitement of participating the excitement of engagement and the excitement of rewards can be very very uh, gratifying and satisfying as i said in business schools we extensively use it harvard ncr they're all big uh, you know players in the simulation market and uh, certainly it works okay um one person is asking how could family parents and grandparents be helped with apprehensions about sending kids abroad and also in unfortunate cases where kids return due to that's a great question again miss salma i presume she must be a parent a concerned parent at that ma'am this is going to you know be cyclical okay be prepared so we have i'll again share our own example we have the multi-campus experience for the real risk takers, the daredevils, if I may use the term, who are paid, who have registered, who will get an experience in Dubai, who will move to Sydney and to Singapore. Then we have a second category who are play it safe category, okay? And the play it safe category of people who said, we will study only in Dubai, we'll get the global exposure. We are happy with that. Then we have a third group of people whom I'd like to call super careful, okay? Nothing wrong in it. And we have provided the platforms within our Mumbai campus. We have two of them, and God willing, in the next few months, by the end of the year, we'll have a flush new, brand new campus because of the enormous opportunities and potential that we see for Indian students. You can sit here. And as I said, today, technology allows it. I would encourage you to visit on YouTube our ELO technology. It's as good as a physical classroom. In this, I can't see you, you can see me. But in an ELO, 
I can see all my 50 to 60 students. I can actually, and we encourage them to put on the videos. You can't hide away. So I know exactly whether you're listening to me, nodding your head, or you're fiddling around with your mobile. And we have marks for that. If they switch off and go, they lose their attendance. So we have created some very, very exciting experiences within that. I can connect with students across the world from Sydney on one side to Colombia on the other side. And I'm deliberately using this because these are different time zones. And I can stay in Dubai or India and teach. So we have seven of these yellow studios, uh, three, two in Mumbai, three in Dubai, uh, one in Singapore, and one in Sydney. So we have. And so if I want a professor to come and teach, I'll give you another example. Uh, July 24th, we are having our graduation, right from undergrad students, the BBA students, to our master students, to our MBA students, to our executive MBA students, and doctoral students. Guess who is the keynote speaker? A co-founder of Netflix, Mitch Ho, who is speaking all the way from California. This is the power of technology today. Now, I could not have not dreamt of getting Mitch Ho to Dubai or Singapore. He'd have 100 engagements. Today, he's happy to do it at zero cost because technology today facilitates that. So this is how we need to look at it. So ma'am, I think, yes, there would be challenges. Be prepared for it. But as I said, all these countries are extremely conscious, extremely cautious. Singapore, UAE, and Australia, do your homework before you send it. Safety protocols, health protocols, quarantine protocols, they are much ahead of India. So I presume you're from India, Ms. Salma. I would say I've lived in all these countries. The standards are much, much higher. So you can rest assured if you're sending your child. God forbid. It's very unfortunate. We wish and pray it doesn't happen. Six months down the line, a third or fourth wave, which many of these doomsday pundits are threatening us with. If it happens, and if the countries decide, then yes. Otherwise, I think things will slowly limp back to normalcy. Uh, that is what I would say. I've answered the Australia, I've answered the parents' concern. Uh, let me see if there are any more questions. Uh, recording, all this you guys will answer. Uh, what else? Yeah. Okay, experiential, yes. Uh, experiential learning. So, what do we? What can we do? So, students, I told you the gamification, the sim simulation. The third way is when you're doing a global uh, learning, you expose them to global experiences. What do we? Do? I'll give you an example again. Uh, when they come to Dubai, they learn 40 to 50 percent. They learn in the classroom, which is conventional. 50 percent is happening outside. So, we take them to. Ferrari World. Many of you may be familiar. It's the largest indoor theme park in the world, Ferrari World. So right from morning, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, students have a whale of a time enjoying all the rides and they do it. And then before they leave the center, they would spend 45 minutes to one hour with a senior management team member of Ferrari World, which talks about how does Ferrari World make money? So these are students. So the finance guy looks at it from the financial perspective. The marketing guy looks at it from the marketing perspective. The supply chain guy looks at it from the operations perspective, so on and so forth. So the learning by experience happens. So when you're exposed to these different actual face-to-face -face experiences, your brain is again absorbing and learning through these experiences. So simulations, games, and live projects, and of course, visits to these places, would be absolutely the way to move forward. I think I've answered most of these questions. Uh, all Indians, we need to learn. Absolutely, Rita, that is a very, very powerful statement. I love that statement. You hit my heart. Okay, definitely, yes. That's what I said when I explained to Vaishnavi that we should never lose our Indianness. We are so rich. First of all, we need to know our heritage. I mean, I'm adding another word to what you said, uh, Rita, which is heritage. We need to be so clear about our heritage. We have a heritage which is 10,000 years old. The two oldest languages come from India, Sanskrit and the language I speak, Tamil. Both of them come from India. And we have had fascinating history of, we have never invaded any country in our 10,000 years. We have only welcomed people from all over the world. That's what we have done. And we have contributed so much to uh, science and technology and philosophy and spirituality. So yes, you're very right, uh, Ms. Rita Das Gupta, that we need to learn our culture and we should never ever leave that because it's coming back. India's Ayurveda is now rocking. 
okay, in spite of all the resistance from allopathy, trying to fight us. I don't subscribe to uh, Patanjali's, uh, you know, uh, viewpoint, but I certainly respect Ayurveda. It is a science by itself, okay? I don't like the uh, very nonsensical statements made by those people, but I definitely believe Ayurveda is a science. Okay, uh, mom of eight year old. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yes, okay, that's Ms. Salma, who's a mom from Musket. Okay, great. Okay, uh, wonderful. Uh, for school going kids. Uh, okay, what else? What, what, what does she want? Suma says, I'm looking for some inputs for school going kids. What exactly? Could you articulate that, ma'am? I would be able to answer that. Uh, okay, it's, it's very similar. See, kids. They, of course, need the, the one thing they will miss, which we need to give them as soon as possible, is the power of collaborative play. They need to go to a playground. They need to go to a park. We effectively killed it even when the parks were open. Sorry to say this, with all due respect to parents. OK, so uh, because uh, we would keep them confined to those video games and mobiles and all that, and now we regret we're saying they're all the time in the mobile phones. But the first opportunity comes, please take them out. We need that open play. That is very important. And I love them to experiment. That is very critical. Yeah. Uh, there's another question. Ah, experiential learning for school kids. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, there are a number of games available. Okay. You can go to the rest of I'll see if I can share some resources. There are some very interesting resources which teachers share, school teachers share among each other. I'll see if I can. I, I think I have uh, Ms. Vaishnavi's uh, email. I will share it with her and you can share it with them. That'd be very, very useful. Um, do you have different fees? No, no, sir. Whoever it was, uh, we don't have different fees for Indians and NRIs. We do have one common fees for everybody. But here's the good news. If the student is extremely good, if he or she is really good, and really good doesn't mean only academics. You can be a hot shot, uh, you know, extracurricular achiever, plus good academics, good communication. You can also look for a scholarship from 10% of the tuition fees to up to 100% of the tuition fees will be given uh okay so miss bina says okay uh, some of them want to connect with me i don't mind if you want to share my email id i'd be happy to answer any questions so uh, you can share that with them okay so that is uh, another question i think it's another parent yeah she's a parenting coach three parenting coach okay please uh, you will get that so you can certainly uh, get it from miss vaishnavi yeah uh, uh, she's put it across, right? Chris at spjane.org. Uh, I keep traveling. I keep participating in different functions. So I might have, uh, I might not sometimes immediately respond. So excuse me for that. But certainly I will respond. And uh, if there are no more questions, I think there are no more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think right. I'll yeah. One minute. I want some guidance on internships. Are you talking about, I don't know whether he's talking about our programs or talking about, see again, internships. Today, internships are gone digital gone global. So you just Google digital internships, online internships. My daughter is doing one now. She's doing a second one now. She's in college. She's in the third year now, honors program. Again, work from home or learn from home, whatever you want to call it. Uh, she's a very conscientious girl. So she says, I don't want to waste my time. So the first one was absolutely free. She didn't get any money. She was upset, but I said, it's the experience. This one, she gets paid to do digital work. So online uh, internships. At SPJ, we encourage internships for our undergrads. So every year, when you move from Singapore, you do an internship in Singapore. When you come to Dubai, you do an internship in Dubai. When you go to Sydney, you do internships. Some of them will be paid, some of them will be unpaid, but we encourage, strongly encourage our students to do it. This is fascinating. You can go to a website and check out all the internship opportunities. MGB is compulsory. They do a four month internship and almost 55 to 60% of them convert the internships into placements. Okay, right. So that's it, I think. Lovely. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, I think we've covered all the questions. So now I'll uh, take your leave. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was great having you on board. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And wish all the students, parents, concerned parents, and teachers the very best. And God bless you all. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.